For eight days in May, Cape Breton is an island of fear. The brutal execution-style murder of three McDonald's restaurant employees sparks the largest manhunt in island history. When you search your own, I'm not drilling it. I'm telling you right to your face that you knew something about me, and I told you right back, I don't. I asked him, I said, you're off the come, and he goes, yeah, well, I finally got to slit somebody's throat. Tried and convicted, three Cape Breton youth tarnish the image of the Maritimes forever. Now, from ATV News, Innocence Lost, the seven shots that shook Sydney River. Good evening, I'm Steve Murphy. At ATV News, we cover news for the home front. Stories about the Maritimes, about our lifestyles and our values, and about our people, the lawmakers and the lawbreakers. But of all of the stories we have ever covered, one stands out as the most gruesome and the most calculated. It was on the morning of May 7th, 1992, early that morning, that seven shots rang out inside the McDonald's restaurant in Sydney River, Nova Scotia. The police figure only six or ten minutes elapsed between the first shot and the last shot. But in that very brief period of time, a terrible crime was committed, a crime that forever changed Cape Breton Island. Three of those McDonald's restaurant employees were killed. A fourth was permanently disabled. All four shot in the head. ETV's Fonts Jessam began covering this story within minutes of that last shot. And tonight, he brings us the whole story of Innocence Lost, the seven shots that shook Sydney River. This is where the planning for the Sydney River McDonald's robbery began. It's a coffee shop in downtown Sydney. A very busy place during the day, it also becomes quite crowded late at night as teens and young adults gather here after an evening on the town. 18-year-old Darren Richard Muse, Derek Anthony Wood, also 18, and Freeman Daniel McNeil, 23. They were typical of the crowd at the coffee shop. Nothing about the three led anyone to suspect they were planning one of this country's most brutal and senseless crimes. They, they weren't the type of kids. They, weren't, they weren't, didn't seem like bad kids. They, they were never really in trouble before. Darren was always quite an athlete in the Taekwondo, and Derek was always quiet. Uh, when I heard the news, I was, I was totally shocked. This is the Sydney River McDonald's restaurant, the target of the robbery being planned by Wood, McNeil, and Muse. Wood had been working here about two months. Co-workers and management described him as a quiet boy who kept to himself. According to the store manager, he had no real friends among the staff. Workers say Wood was awkward. He was not awkward with his newfound friends in crime. He convinced McNeil and Muse that between eighty and two hundred thousand dollars waited for them in the safe at the restaurant. McNeil wanted money because he was unemployed and was fixing up his girlfriend's mother's car. Muse said he needed money to get to Vancouver where he had a job lined up with the Hells Angels. As they drove around, the plan evolved. Darren Muse would wear a mask and use his martial arts skills to subdue any workers encountered. Wood felt he knew enough of the combination to open the safe. After an aborted attempt, the trio decided upon the early morning of May 7th as the time for the robbery. Freeman McNeil took a tiny silver 22 caliber handgun from his girlfriend's home. He practiced shooting on a deserted beach. On the night of May 6th, McNeil drove Wood to work and gave Wood the gun. Wood's shift was an uneventful one, but when his work was completed, he did not leave. He stayed, smoking and talking to other workers. He helped Arlene McNeil conduct inventory. An hour later, he would shoot her in the face. While Wood helped Arlene, Darren Muse and Freeman McNeil sat at a nearby coffee shop, waiting for his call. Wood was to tell them when the restaurant was empty, and they could come to a basement door. Both McNeil and Muse donned an extra set of clothing. Derek Wood did not call. Instead, he walked to the shop, leaving his kit bag holding open the door. The three men headed to a deserted dirt road across from the restaurant. Later, they told police they believed all the workers had left for the night. But on the way to the basement door, they walked past the cars of Donna Warren, Neil Burroughs, and Arlene McNeil. The three men entered the basement door where Wood loaded the gun. They began to head for the stairs. As they approached, they were surprised by Donna and Arlene. Recognizing Derek Wood, Arlene laughed, asking, is this a joke? The three robbers stood, Muse wearing a Halloween mask, McNeil a plaid jacket and hunting cap, 
Derek Wood looked at his partners, raised the tiny gun, and pulled the trigger, shooting his co-worker. Arlene fell to the floor, grasping a handful of balloon sticks she was carrying. She had been preparing for a child's birthday party to be held at the restaurant the next day. Donna Warren dropped to the floor and cried beside her fallen friend. It was at this point, while Arlene McNeil lay here bleeding and Donna Warren lay beside her crying, that prosecutors told the juries in the trials that followed the three men hatched their plan. A plan to kill everyone, to use silence as their ally. Derek Wood began to act on that plan immediately as he ran through this door and upstairs to where cleaner Neil Burroughs was working. Upstairs, Wood pulled the trigger again. Burroughs was shot in the head, but death would not come quickly for the young husband and father. With Burroughs down, Wood returned for Donna Warren, shouting, come on, bitch, as he led her to the upstairs safe. As shift manager, she had the combination. She fumbled and cried, I'm moving as fast as I can, as she turned the dial. As the door opened, Wood shot her in the back of the head. She fell back against the wall, and he shot her again, this time in the eye. Wood then began clearing out the safe. In his haste, he left hundreds of dollars lying about in cash drawers readied for the morning shift. McNeil and Muse were over near the sinks where Neil Burroughs had fallen. McNeil told police Muse stood by Burroughs with blood all over his gloved hands, saying he won't die. Derek shot him and I cut his throat, but he won't die. Burroughs begged McNeil for help, but McNeil struck him with a shovel handle, knocking him back to the floor. In McNeil's version of what happened next, Darren Muse stood over Burroughs and fired a shot into his head. Muse told police he was by the safe, that McNeil had the gun when he heard a shot from the area by Burroughs. The three then headed for the rear door, where they met James Fagan. The maintenance man was more than an hour early for work, as was his habit. He greeted McNeil, Muse, and Wood, saying, hi, guys. He was then shot in the head by Freeman McNeil. The robbers ran back to the car. They threw the money in the back, in all $2,017.72. Also littering the floor were hollow point 22 caliber bullets. Wood realized his kit bag, which contained his McDonald's name tag, was still holding the basement door ajar. Incredibly, the trio headed back to the restaurant to grab the bag and make sure Arlene McNeil was dead. When they arrived here, they saw the taxi that had taken James Fagan to work. The driver had heard the shot that killed Fagan and radioed for police. The killers drove to a nearby bridge where Wood got out and ran to call police and tell them he was smoking outside when he heard shots and ran. As Wood ran, the first police officers arrived. What was inside, even veteran officers found so senseless and grisly, they cried. Upon arriving on a crime scene, police quickly secure it to protect evidence. In the early stages, that did not happen here. Police believed the gunmen were still inside. They slowly searched the restaurant, guns drawn, as ambulance attendants and taxi drivers attended to the fallen victims. The scene was so confusing, a curious motorist was able to stop and almost enter the restaurant. I was kind of curious as to what was going on down there, and I walked down over the hill there, and uh, I walked right up almost five feet from the door, maybe even a little closer, and uh, when I looked inside, I could uh, see a lot of blood around. The call quickly went out. Reinforcements arrived, and forensic experts began to comb the crime scene both inside and out. While police looked for evidence, Darren Muse and Freeman McNeil were destroying it. After counting out the money at McNeil's home, they went to a nearby brook and threw away a cash box, some McDonald's coupons, Muse's shoes, and two knives he carried during the robbery. They had already discarded the shells from the gun and the clothing they had worn over their street clothes. Derek Wood wandered around until police picked him up to take his statement. In this video recorded that morning, Wood is inside the police car parked at the bottom of the restaurant driveway, about to take an officer along the route he claimed to have run after hearing the shots. The officer did not believe him. Wood was taken to the Sydney RCMP detachment for questioning as officers held the first briefing for reporters. As a result of an apparent armed robbery, two persons were shot and killed, and two other persons were shot and are in critical condition in Sydney City Hospital. All four victims are employees of the Sydney River McDonald's restaurant. In the first few hours of May 7th, officers concentrated on the story given by Derek Wood, finding problems with it early on. Wood claimed he had run away from the basement door, yet footprints led from the door into the restaurant, not away from it. Wood got a break as police were sent on what they later called a wild goose chase. A woman came forward saying she knew who committed the crime. Officers concentrated on this false lead and Derek Wood was allowed to go home. As Mounties searched for their new suspects, people in Cape Breton began to react to the shootings.
We've gone from a so-called tranquil community, uh, a community with easy living type of uh, atmosphere, uh, to one of violent crime on a, almost on a daily basis. And that's quite a transition. I think the thing that's really disturbing about this is the violence. Uh, we know that people come in and if they're looking for a few bucks, uh, we give it to them and they go and that's the end of the incident. But this, this seems to be the violence where they're killing people and uh, it is getting uh, really scary. On May 8th, as police picked up the men they believed were responsible, hundreds gathered in the street to watch. Later, investigators checked the alibis provided by the suspects and realized the mistake they'd made. The suspects that were in custody had been released. Uh, and the status of the investigation is that it's continuing uh, even more upbeat than it was before. There are a number of things we're looking into. Within hours of releasing the suspects arrested that Friday, RCMP began focusing on Derek Wood. Wiretaps and a surveillance team were used. Wood led officers to Freeman McNeil and Darren Muse. McNeil had driven Wood to work on the night of the robbery, and Muse was McNeil's alibi for the time of the shootings. During the week before their arrest, the three partied with friends, played pool, and McNeil purchased a number of car stereo components. In checking McNeil's alibi, police found Darren Muse evasive. They asked Muse to take a polygraph, something being done with people police hope to eliminate as suspects. We have obtained the RCMP videotape of that lie detector interview. Close your eyes and remain perfectly still during the time I'm asking the questions. Okay? Okay. It's important that you remain perfectly still. Scratch everything. Last week, were you involved in any way with the theft or the robbery at McDonald's? No. When the 18-year-old failed, police pushed for an explanation. Safety. And from those charts today, there's no doubt in my mind you're connected with this situation of murders at McDonald's. You know something about it. And no. if you can sit here and deny that, there's a terrible, something going terrible wrong up there in your head. No, I have a conscience and I'm telling you that... Well, there's right. something wrong with that conscience, Darren, because people just don't do this. Normal people don't do this. And you came in here today and you didn't pass that polygraph test. What's that going to tell me? It's got to tell me that that heart inside your body is reacting to those particular questions in relation to that murder. No, no, no. Well, when you start drilling, I'm, I'm not drilling it. I'm telling you right to your face that mm -hmm. you knew something about it. Yeah. And I told you right back, I don't. That's you did. Now, now come on, Darren. Be honest with me, boy. I am. You're not. I told well, you. Who are you afraid of? No one. There's got to be somebody, Darren. No. Holy jeez, boy. There's so many inconsistencies. I'm working on his stuff. When he was shot here in the back of the head, when his neck was cut, when he was shot there, when he was shot through the air because he wouldn't stay down. Were you there then? Or the poor bastard when you were going out the door and he was coming in because he was late for his shift. Were you there when he got drilled right there? Tell me. Tell me. I wasn't. You weren't there. Drilling you? I told you that I had nothing to do with it. I wasn't there. Nothing to do with it. You weren't there. Did you have knowledge of it? No. Come on, Darren. I mean, you've got three people killed. Does that matter to you? Like, you're a big yawn. So I'm what? Sorry, I'm tired. I'm going to say one thing. You told me when I came here, right? Yeah. If I want to leave, I can leave. And you said you'll leave right there and that's right. I we can go. Five, sure. Five, we can go. Times. Okay. We can go, but you just remember that there's three people dead. Mm -hmm. You don't. We don't believe you. Okay? Mm -hmm. We don't believe you one little bit. You're not pulling the wool over our eyes. Someday, some policeman's going to come to your door. Right? Number eight, retain and instruct counsel without delay. The following day, Freeman McNeil was picked up and pressed on inconsistencies in his statements. McNeil changed his story. He took police on a reenactment to support his new claim that he only picked up Darren Muse following the robbery. This is the RCMP video of that reenactment. I asked him, I said, you're awfully calm, and he goes, yeah, well, I finally got to slit somebody's throat. Did he actually say that in those words? He said that in those words. I never asked Darren or Derek about, about the gun. Derek was the one that did all the shooting, but I think it was probably Darren, because I saw Derek a few days later, and Darren was, uh, you know, very shaken up, and... About this point, he walked down... McNeil showed police where Muse had disposed of evidence, a brook where they had recovered a cash box and knife two days earlier. Later, police told McNeil they had information linking him to the crime, and he refused to cooperate further. Officers pressed, but he remained silent and was arrested.
Using information provided by McNeil, police set out to arrest Darren Muse and Derek Wood, and a third man McNeil named, who police discovered was not involved. That man and Wood were at a Sydney club celebrating Wood's 19th birthday. We just walked out, and the cops were all around, and uh, our two friends got arrested, and we got taken down for questioning. We were in there having a few drinks, and we walked out. And we walked out when the fellows, when the fellows we were with was already in the police car. And uh, we came out, and uh, the police were all around us, and they threw one up against, you know, put him up against the wall, put the cuffs on him, and told him he was under arrest for murder. The first of the three suspects to break under the police pressure was Derek Wood, when after hours of sitting in this chair and insisting on his right to remain silent, he leaned forward and picked up a list of the charges against him and said, guilty, guilty. I'm not sure about that one. Guilty, not guilty, and guilty. He was asked by police why. He said he was scared, and then gave them their first detailed account of what took place inside the restaurant. While Wood confessed, McNeil slept in the cell. Police woke him and showed him Derek Wood's statement. After being pressed for hours, he confessed. Darren Muse talked after being shown the statements of his two accomplices, statements that incriminated him in the murder of Neil Burroughs. All three have appeared before a justice of the peace and have been remanded in custody. Public outrage surfaced as hundreds turned out for the first court appearance. Three trials were held. First, a jury heard conflicting views of Derek Wood's involvement. His defense claimed he confessed to protect a friend, that he never took part in the shootings. The Crown disagreed. After 12 hours of deliberations, the jury sided with the Crown. Relief. Oh, God. That he can't hurt anybody else. Relief for the families was short-lived. The Darren Muse trial started the next day. That trial did not proceed far before a change in plea to reduce charges was accepted by the Crown. Three months later, Freeman McNeil stood trial in Halifax. The venue change had been requested by his lawyers because of intense publicity surrounding the first two hearings. The jury found him guilty of the first-degree murder of Neil Burroughs, but only of second-degree murder in the shooting of James Fagan. The victim's families were upset with what they felt was a lack of justice. I'm totally the justice system stinks. Here they come now. Come on, boys, right now. All three men were sentenced to life in prison. For Muse, parole could come after 20 years. For Wood and McNeil, after 25. For the families, the ordeal is far from over. With the trials behind them, the relatives of the four victims have begun trying to put their lives back in order. For Neil Burroughs' family, there are constant reminders of the loving father who lived for his baby boy, of the brother who loved joking with his sisters and brothers. But every day we sit home and we wait. I sit at my kitchen table and I wait every day for my brother to come and have a cup of tea with me. And my family wait for him to visit. The son came to see his father and I in the mornings on his way home from back shift. And we still expect him to come to see us. And his father is very upset. His father's heart is broke. And his father just wants to get out and take justice in his own hands because the legal system, works, the the legal system works for the guilty not for the, the, the victims Thanks. james fagan grew up in a happy home filled with brothers and sisters jimmy was the easygoing one in the crowd and his family still find his violent death difficult to accept our own boys will say the other boys will say why jim he was so easy going why it could have been sort of me i can get a holler or, get mad at times, but why should it be Jim? It, it's just... Yeah, like, just the way it turned out, I guess. Not much you can do. Yeah, but it's really... But Jim, I don't know, he had a, he had a knack with people. Uh, like, I wrote a victim's impact statement, and I said that Jim never saw ugly people or pretty people. He just saw people, and he liked them. We, anything that you want now or plan on doing, it hasn't got that same impact that it had before. Christmas coming vacations, we have a summer cottage, we haven't been out there. I think we spent two, maybe three days out there since it's happened with Jim. I don't know, I just can't understand how we're going to get our lives back together again. It's going to take a long time. I think Alan and I will we'll be gone and our children will still be trying to wonder why this happened. Well, we pretty well know why it happened. I mean, uh, Everywhere you read, it still says a botched robbery, but I don't believe that theory at all. They went in there, 
They wanted the experience of killing somebody. Muse wanted to cut somebody's throat. The others wanted to watch somebody die with a bullet in his head. That's why it was done. Every day, Olive Warren visits the graveyard near her home. She comes to remember Donna, the little girl who loved school and hoped to someday be a criminal lawyer. Olive tries to understand what happened. To me, it was not a robbery that went bad. To me, it was an execution. Um, if they had went there to rob the place, they would have got the money. There was no problem with that. She would have gave it to them. She have always told us. If for any reason anybody came in to rob her while she was there, she'd give them the money. Right now, this is all I have left of her. These guys are in prison. They're able to see the sunlight. They're able to watch TV. They're able to exercise. But all I have is a grave here with a headstone and a picture of Donna on it. That's it for me. I talked to her. It's a comforting just being here, being close to her. And it's her when I turn around to walk away. It's like uh, her voice is saying, yeah, you're leaving me. Why don't you stay? Arlene McNeil is the only surviving victim. The young girl who loved to party with friends and shop and plan for the future has a very different daily routine now. What do, what do you do here in a day? What do you play on the computer? Is that part of the therapy? Mm -hmm. Are you good at it? Yeah. Arlene's dreams and her hopes are gone. You know? Um, if she was determined that she was going to go through university, get her degree. And uh, she was, she had a steady boyfriend and they were talking about after she finishes her education, she was going to get married and have children. She was always told me she wanted two children, a boy and a girl. And uh, that's all taken away. That's my pride and joy and my star. You know, she's here and that's, that's what we want. And... Members of the victims' families have started a campaign aimed at changing the Canadian criminal justice system. They want to see a return to capital punishment or at least the introduction of consecutive sentences in cases of multiple murder. However, they say even if they win that fight, it will do very little to reduce the pain from the permanent scars left from the seven shots fired in Sydney River. The most frequently asked question about these brutal murders is how could three seemingly normal young men take part in this kind of violence? Well, a forensic psychiatrist offers the group dynamic as a possible explanation. That is that people will do in a group with peer support and peer pressure things they would never do as individuals. But that is only a theory. The question of why they did it will never be answered. From ATV News, heartfelt thanks to the families of the four victims for allowing us to help them tell their tragic story. And thank you for watching.